Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, day three of the fifth annual Women Teach Trading and Investing event from Synergy Traders, or, or part of the Synergy Trader series, brought to you by tradeoutloud.com and timingresearch.com. So, um, uh, of course, all these presentations are for educational purposes, on purposes only, and trading is not suitable for all people. Please consult with a uh, financial advisor and only trade with money you can afford to lose. All of these sessions will be recorded individually and uh, available on the Timing Research website, as well as YouTube, podcasts, and Substack. So I want to uh, thank Tony Hansen for being our uh, coming back for a second presentation and uh, opening the day uh, today. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, David. Um, so yesterday in the session that I did, I had an ask all your questions type of session. And um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to cover some of the tools and techniques that I use when I'm trading. So we're going to look at uh, what I call my five building blocks of price development. And what those are is that whenever we are developing a system or a strategy in the market, we're looking basically for pros and cons. You know, we're looking, if we're looking at a reversal strategy, we want something that's been exhausted in the trend, something that has major resistance levels and isn't going to just go into a period of congestion as it corrects. We want something that is actually going to reverse with really strong momentum. And the same thing with a breakout, you know, determining, hey, is this breakout too early to sustain itself? Or is it something that is going to take a lot longer to develop before it really has a good opportunity for a nice move? And I'll share with you some of my trades that I had yesterday as we were kind of wrapping up this, the day yesterday, because we have some good examples of what all of these building blocks entail. And there's five of them. And in name, there are very simple ideas and concepts. We're looking at our trends development. We're looking at momentum. We're looking at time development, support and resistance levels, and volume. Now, trend development tends to be a tricky one for a lot of traders because it's difficult for many of them to understand you know when a trend is actually ending versus when it still has more potential i know it was something that i struggled with learning for a long time when i first started trading uh knowing hey is this really the exhaustion that we have going on or is there still room for another bull flag or bear flag and what I've found is that there's a couple of key traits that will help us determine when a trend is truly exhausting and when it has better potential that we might see a continuation. So I'm going to start with just kind of pulling up our chart here. And we'll look really simply at trend development to begin with. I talked a bit about this yesterday. And for those of you that have any questions that you want to ask, um, I've been trading for over 25 years, basically full time. Um, I started when the markets were really just kind of switching off of the floor. There were still a lot of floor traders back then, but it wasn't uh, becoming as um, desirable for newer traders. You know, they were starting to want to look for other places that uh, they could um dive into i'm trying to find my mouse here there we go grab my pen so i want to draw for you here's my little drawing tool it's hiding i've got so many charts open here on a couple of monitors so i'm going to make this bigger here and we're going to take a look at what's happening in the dow as we are heading into today's session. Because the Dow offers us a really good glimpse of 
typical trends type of movement. And one of the key traits that I talked about yesterday is that when we're looking at waves of development in a trend, I often focus more upon waves of two than waves of three. Um, when I look at waves of three, it's often in the context of, hey, this is just waves of two that are tilted. So if we look at our sell off, for example, here, as we were coming off of the highs, we had a little bit of a longer zone of congestion. We were breaking that more immediate uptrend channel, fell pretty quickly, and then had a little bit of this smaller correction here. Now, what you'll notice, though, is that the time development that it took for each of these moves was a little bit different. This one was about half that distance. So when we're counting waves or when I'm counting waves, what I'm doing is I'm looking for zones of correction that are lasting about the same amount of time. So this here again is very comparable to the one here. So I'm starting my breakdown trend from here. One, two, three. Now other ways that this can look though is we have an upside move here, goes into that congestion, secondary congestion or correction here. And then the second move. So we have one, baby two, and three. And yet our periods for how long these corrections are taking are, are about the same. Each of these stronger moves is called an impulse move. And the nice thing about them is that they tend to repeat over and over again really similar sizes when we have similar momentum. So they can help identify levels where that impulse move is going to have a harder time. We've got impulse moves on larger time frames like this entire move here and the entire move down here, but we also have those smaller segment, segmental little moves. So when I'm looking at trends development, I'm primarily looking at wave one, two waves of correction, and then a second wave. So wave one, two waves of correction, second wave. Wave one, two waves of correction, second wave. And I want those waves of correction to be pretty comparable overall in terms of how long they're taking to develop. And it really helps me have a good feel for, hey, at the end of that level, I have a better chance that things can start to shift. We could start to get um, a change in the momentum. So momentum is really a huge key indicator in terms of how fast something is going to be able to turn around. We do see markets where we get kind of more of the pivot type of high or low, but the more predictable ones are going to be the ones where you're actually seeing more of a rounding high or low. And it's not that one of them is going to give us a move that is better than the other. It's just in terms of predictability. What is our most probable outcome coming off of a reversal? And it's when we start to see momentum beginning to shift. And that's going to take me into what we had as we were wrapping up the day yesterday. And I want to show you a strategy that I traded at the end of the day and uh, basically teach this strategy to you and look at it in terms of these components, the trends development, the momentum, the time development, support and resistance levels, and volume. So the trade that I want to share with you is called a momentum reversal plus. And for that, we're going to drop down to some smaller time frames. But first, Notice that on our larger time frame here, we are coming into a lot of congestion over here. So we have a pretty good support level and we are starting to see momentum begin to shift after that third comparable impulse move down. So this tells me it's a good level to look for bounces off of that zone, whether they're a scalp or something that can turn into something where it's actually has a better chance of sustained follow through. So let me clear this and we are going to boogie on down to some smaller time frames here.
And I might go back and grab my screenshots from yesterday too. To show you as well. Hold on one second. Let me do that quick. So I'm just going to open up my screenshot program. So uh, a lot of my trades that I take, I go ahead and I save them in a journal. And that's really crucial, you guys. Um, when you are trading, if you're not mapping your trades and, and like going back and studying your trades after the fact, you're missing a huge opportunity in your trading. How many of you are actually keeping a trading journal? Anyone out there? <laughs> a lot of times people start with their, their best intentions, right? To come in and they'll start, but they won't keep at it. And so it's so, so important, you guys, that you always have a trading journal. And when I look at a trading journal, I, in fact, we can teach this or uh, treat this as my journal entry because I don't have this journal entry done from yesterday. It was right at the very end of the trading day. Um, but what we want to do is we want to look at not just where we get into a position and where we got out of a position, right? I mean, okay, that's going to tell us overall gains or losses, but it's not going to tell us much about the pros and cons for the patterns that we traded and what things are going to increase our risk and what things are going to decrease our risk. Um, Raju asked, you know, how do I, I know what tick to use? I, I actually have multiple time frames up on my screens. I've got four monitors that I use. I know that's like nothing compared to what some traders use. They're, they're big monitors, but um, I have four main ones. And I have different time frames and um, different markets too as well on all of those charts some of them are candles or some of them are candlestick charts some of them are line charts some of them are time frame charts like a five second um, and then others are tick charts like the 200 tick here most of the time i'm not going to trade a strategy on the nasdaq that is under a 200 tick um, i might use something under it for timing the entry on a larger strategy, but the strategy itself, I want to be on a bigger time frame. And let me see if I got a better chart here from yesterday too. So here is a little bit better view. And I'll go to the chart so we can see it, it more in context. Um, but this is what I used uh, to take a screenshot of for my, um, trading journal. So what I was watching here, and actually, you know what, let me grab that chart to put kind of up in the corner so you can see it. Not our Dow. The NASDAQ. So my goal is when you come out of here, this class here today, you'll have a good feel for this strategy here. So I'm going to kind of just put this up here and show you where we're at in that bigger trend. So notice that a lot of yesterday, we were just in this chopping range back and forth. This is a thousand tick chart that I've got all squished together. And so what I was primarily focused on, and this is what I told my traders yesterday, is that we want to look at just the smaller reversal patterns. Look to trade as we're coming off of the upper and lower end of the ranges. And one second. sorry throat tickle and so we were looking at just the smaller reversals coming off 
of the highs and lows within that action in the morning. And then I had class over noon. And what we were looking at for the afternoon was I told them to look for that congestion to double out before we would start to see some stronger patterns beginning to come back into play again. And that in the meantime, just focus on action that would be going back and forth within that range. So that doubling out concept, um, the reason that I told them, hey, we would expect to be in a range for twice as long, and it was 12 o'clock when we started class, uh, one o'clock when we ended class, is that as this was trying to come out of uh, a megaphone here, you can see it struggled and came back into the range. So usually if some sort of a breakout pattern doesn't get going when you're expecting it to with like a comparable congestive type of move. So normally in our markets, we'll have periods of congestion or correction that'll last about that same amount of time. And if you're looking for a setup to take place at that time, but it doesn't go at the time you're expecting, if you go and double that time out, that's usually the next zone that you have a higher probability of getting a strategy um, going. So if you're trading breakout patterns, for example, and you get something trying to break and it's a little bit early. Well, if you look at about doubling that out, that's your next highest probability zone for a trade. So if it tries and it comes back and tries, you know, like at like a third more or a half more, that's more likely that that's going to be a trap. And uh, you could easily just get flushed out of, of a position there. So what I was looking at was, okay, we're stuck in this range. Let's just focus on some of the back and forth action in here. And you can see clearly that when we're in a range, two wave movements are very, very common, very popular uh, to see. So if you're in midway in a trading range, best to look for a continuation. If you're at the lower end of the range, best to look for a reversal. And that brings us to the setup here. So this reversal pattern at the lows yesterday, heading into that last hour of the day is what I call a momentum reversal. And what I'm looking for is a trend that typically has two waves down. We call this the leg. This is your hip, this is your knee, this is your foot, here's your ankle. So what I want to see in that momentum reversal is I want it to be at a decent level of support which you can see it was right at the zone where this had broken higher in uh, yesterday's trading. It had kind of a, a Chevron pullback to it. So I was looking at this as a version of a Phoenix, which is one of my favorite reversal strategies. Also timing, pretty decent for inverse head and shoulders off of the lower end of that range as well. So what we look for in a momentum reversal, the pattern looks like this a leg with a kneecap. Kneecap here is a little bit longer. Usually these are like a one to one to one ratio. So if you've got like 30 bars down, 30 bars across, 30 bars down, that's like pretty common. And then what I wanna see is a sequence of two Vs and inverse Vs, even spacing between the lows. And then my trigger point is a break in that channel there. In yesterday's session, though, you can see it had a really strong drop down and then went into a smaller momentum reversal that also had three lows. So I used, I actually built a little bit into the position as it was doing that, but I used the break of that foot as my primary uh, entry trigger. And my stop placement on this pattern is you take this line here, you look at zones where you get like these little retests of highs and lows kind of back in the past, add that on and put your stop under that channel. So in this case, you're looking at stop zone right here. Now, the main risk we run into on this particular one is that look at the foot here. It's still inside this channel for the trading range. So what this means is that there is a potential that it could come out 
and do a base before it tries to go. Um, if it has a slower move up, we could get something that comes flushes and then reverses. I was not as worried about either of those um, considerations in this particular one because of the placement on that bigger time frame. So since this was coming back with more of like a V into the breakout zone here, what I wanted to see was a pretty rapid turnaround. Whereas something that's just coming off of like a downtrend and then it has that sequence in something like that, there's a bit of a greater risk that we could see one of those other things happening. So this one, since it was, since it was in the range and actually part of a bigger buy setup, that helped get that going. I'll, I'll show you guys here the targets in just a couple minutes. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to show you the entries first and then we'll move over to our targets. And I didn't have a chance. I wanted to grab the screenshot showing my executions, but I didn't have a chance to get it open. <laughs> David had me come in here. Um, I, I gave him a, like, what, 30 minutes notice that I could do it. So I, I don't have the one with the executions on it, but I'll show you where they where those are here. And uh, I can post that in my Telegram channel for those of you that, that follow me throughout the day too. Um, I actually want to go to a different slide here, different window, and pull that up so that you can see the details a little bit better than we have on this. And then we'll talk about the, uh, the target. The target zone is something where I'm looking at measured moves, but on a momentum reversal, there's a very specific formula that we use. I just got to find out where was that? pattern in here. So here's that Phoenix. This is what served as the support as this came back down over here. So one of the things that you'll notice that was really important for me on this is that this was the first break of that bigger downtrend channel over there. So when this popped up and came back down, this momentum was slower. We had those two main waves and this is what I call a T3 support level. And I'm going to explain that T3 notion here, or idea here in a minute too. And so what I was looking at, this is also Fibonacci fan support. Let me put that on there also. And that was helping me guide the entry. And it was actually one of the reasons I had a little bit of an early entry on part of it, and then a little bit later on the rest of it. So here's what I was looking at for my Fibonacci fan. And um, what I noticed was, you know what, these pullbacks here, they're not quite lining up with the Fib fan levels. So what I did was I pulled it down a little bit to hook them up so that we had that first pullback right here before it kind of paused. So you can tell it's the first one because it breaks the channel right here. And because it pulled back less than 50%, this is kind of advanced uh, stuff I'm teaching you guys here, but it pulls back less than 50% and stays in that upper 50% zone. And it does it in less than the amount of time that it takes for the upside move. So I hook up my Fib fan with the 50% level. And that gave me where I wanted to start to look for a buy setup. And what I did originally was when this did the little flush here, I bought part of the position here. And then I adjusted my fan further so that my 76.4% hooked onto that low. And when this went out, I knew that we were still in that downtrend channel, which meant that it could flush down once. The stop that I used is connecting these two lows here projecting out where that third low would be and placing the stop on the books under the channel of that third low. 
And when this came down again and it had the two wave move down here and came back here and here, this is the smaller version of that same pattern. So here's your leg, here's the foot. So here's where I put on most of my position at that point. And what I needed to see coming out of this was something that would have momentum at least as strong and preferably stronger than it was going into it. So what that does is it tells me, is there initial immediate confirmation on the move? And that is what I wanna see. So for adding into it, we had this nice little two wave correction use that to add in and I did the same thing up here as well except um, you'll see that this had a little bit of a flush back into it but I used the first break um, if you look at this here it kind of started to slow right here and then pulled back so technically that little flush allowed for more comparable time development for the continuation now let me show you where I took partials because as this was coming up, I did take partials as it was coming into that zone of, of congestion and, and resistance up here. And what I do for basing target levels on this particular pattern, and you can see that this was also that previous high right there. I look at it in terms of a leg anatomy. So on this, we look at the pullback. This is my hip zone. Here's the kneecap zone. And then you've got also your measured move zone that you're watching for. And then those fan levels are going to serve as, as resistance. So I had had um, partials on the books here. And I wasn't really paying as close of attention to it as I should have, but this had pulled back more than 50% right here. And so by pulling back more than 50%, a lot of times it can struggle when it gets to that previous high. It can have a harder time fully breaking it. So I went ahead and I had partials at that level, but I went and added them back in with this smaller tilted kneecap. And then I changed my larger target to look from here to here for a measured move. And if we look at this by backing this up a little bit further, let's see, I'm going to have to go to a bigger time frame here. We look at, I want to go up to like a thousand tick. right here. Now we can see that. If we look at this here, you can see that now we're, this is where that pattern was. So here's where I took some partials off and then added in, lost kind of like that midway ground. But here and here, and here and here and over and over and over again, we are seeing those comparable bigger impulse moves. And this is that larger T3 or hip zone as a resistance. So if you looked at like the anatomy of this trend move here and we're looking at, hey, on retracement levels, what levels are our primary support levels to watch for? So this is gonna be your hip zone if it's coming back up into it, if you're looking at something coming down, this is your hip zone. It's basically where that channel break happens. So we call that target three. Your target two zone is if this has like a nice two wave move, it's that pause in the middle. In this case, it's a little bit messy. So we take the upper and lower ends of that mess and cut that in half. And that's our T2 or the equivalent of the kneecap. And so these are primary levels that we look for when things are flipping and we're looking at um, trading reversal patterns because those are the zones that we're most likely to see things stall at. 
You can also use Fibonacci retracement levels. Um, look for the Fib levels that are hooking up with some of these. And um, if this impulse move is average to slightly stronger than average or slightly slower than average, you can also use a Fib fan going from the high, the low to the high to look for support levels. In this case, the momentum is too strong. So what you would find is that if you're using a fan on something like this, let me grab it here. As it's coming into some of these support levels, it's not necessarily going to be support that would make the, um, index move higher. Um, can I go over fib fans on how I draw them? Absolutely. Let me show you. I actually have one already here on the Dow. From a trade this morning. So when we are looking at fib fans and using fib fans, one of the key things we have to do is we need to look at what is the momentum of a move, okay? So if you have a trend that looks like this, where there's a lot of really big bars, not a lot of overlap, maybe you get some congestion in the middle, but overall they're, they're really trending bars. You don't have a lot of dojis or overlap from one bar to the next. If you use a fan where you're hooking your high here and your low, low here, and you're looking at where those fan levels can spread out to, they might stall briefly at them, but they're going to have a hard time holding them in order to get a, a really strong continuation move. The type of trends that we want to use most of our fans on are going to be the ones that are more average momentum. So you might get a couple of bursts of stronger impulse moves, but overall your channel is a pretty average momentum move. So even on this, as this comes back down, that's a little bit harder because it's so rapid, but we can take the fan from here to here and use that to project where our support levels are going to be or, or what we're going to look at for them. Um, but the more average your trend move is, the better those fan levels are going to be. So I'll pull up some charts here and show you. And I have very specific rules for drawing fans that go from the very basics to um, more advanced. Um, so an example would be if we're looking at the phoenix that we just had here, it's an inverse head and shoulders. So your very basic phoenix, we would take our fib fan and initially look at here to here. Let me go grab it. And so what I want to do is that when this is forming, I need to look at, I'm going to clear those drawings that I put on there. I need to look at the amount of time it took to make it to the high, and then the amount of time it took before it put in that first low. So what you'll notice is that this put in that kind of main low here as it's pulling down at a level that is more than a 50% retracement and with very strong momentum. So in something like that, you can see that it held that 76.4% zone and bounced and came back, retested it and bounced again really well. But in most of the cases, when this momentum comes down this quickly like this, what I wanna do is I want that first bounce lower to actually hook up with the 61.8%. So there, and what that does is that tells me, hey, if this you know has another additional flush, that's a good level that that could go to. So it might've done that on a candlestick chart too, but that's going to protect me more than if I had used, you know, the absolute 
high is on one of these because of this strong impulse momentum move here. So that's one of the more advanced ways that I will use the, um, the Fibonacci fan. The typical way is just to go from your low to your high, which is great if the momentum is really average. And especially if you're starting to get more gradual corrections coming off of that high. Let's say this is our uptrend and we're looking for a Fib fan from here to here. So if that one has a pullback in that really rapid zone that holds the upper 50% before it stalls, then I'm going to take the Fib fan and hook up the 50% Fib fan with that level. And that would give me 76.4. That would be a good support. Let me actually draw that on there so you can visualize that. So you go from here to here, that would be your typical. And right there, you can see that it hooks up with the 50%. Let me move the other one so you can see it a little bit better. So you can see it hooks up to the 50%. You can't tell that I draw fib lines or fib fans a lot, can you? <laughs> I had it drawn perfectly before we even added it on there. <laughs> so what we would look at would be a setup that would be taking place at that level. Now, the key thing we want for stronger setups that can take off and really break is that, first of all, if this is average to stronger than average momentum here, we prefer that this has a correction that is about twice the upside move. So when that breaks, it's ideal if this is corrected about twice as long. If this is shallower, so let's say our move coming off of the lows is a little bit weaker and then we go into the correction, then you can get more of the one-to-one. -one. If it's stronger and then it goes into the correction, then we want more than two-to-one. So you actually want that to go out closer to like four to one or more. And then it also can have a harder time getting the momentum going as strongly as well. So Fib fans are gonna work best on something that is average in terms of the, the momentum to it. So that's just some of the, the main ways that I use the fans and I'll, I'll, I can show you some other examples here. I use them mostly on some of those initial reversals. So for example, you know, here's another one where it's, it's really strong coming off of it. So we might have a little bit of a harder time with the fan because it has such, that, such strong momentum here to begin with. And so you'll see that this pulls back and has a reaction off of that 76.4, right? But it's also going to be something that is going to trap people. And the reason is that if we look at our pullback here and then how long it takes to get back to that fan, it's taking a shorter amount of time. So B is smaller than A. That means this is more likely to be a trap. So what I want to do with my Fib fan is this pulled back more than 50%. So I need to hook up the 61.8% Fib fan with this pivot here. So I need to adjust my fan. Let me grab my mouse one. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the top of that fan, which I need to clear this so I can see it. <laughs> and I'm going to pull it down so that that pivot right there hooks up with the 61.8%. That now gives me the zone that I really want to look for for a better reversal strategy. So at this point, here's a nice little three wave down. I know that I can look for buy setup at that zone there. But if I had used it where people will traditionally use your fan, just going from that low to that high, I'd have been in big trouble. And I would have taken a stop because 
when I enter these trades, I trail my stop up along the underside of that fan. So if you had trailed it under that that there, you would have got stopped out here, but most traders use under the previous low. So they would have gotten stopped out right before it pivoted. So that's a really good um, trick there for using those FIB fans. And that was an excellent question. How do I measure the target levels? Okay, so some other things to look at for targets. When I have my FIB fans like this, that upper channel is a very good one to use for looking at targets. So I'm going to be looking at measured moves like that as a target zone, but I'm also going to be looking at zones where they're retesting the upper end of those FIB bands as well. And I'm going to look back here and look at, hey, do I have those T2, T3 zones for target levels as well? So if I, oops, back this up. Look at my bigger trend here. I can see that, hey, this setup is also coming off of a pullback where we had a good rally over here. So that measured move would also be something that I would look at for a resistant zone to take uh, some of my profits off. And then I also watch for reversal strategies. So things like where the momentum is shifting, that's going to be something that would clue me in that, hey, you know what, this trend is starting to develop into something that can begin to have a bigger reversal. So as long as the momentum is hitting the target levels with really strong momentum, I'll usually go down into more advanced trade management where I'm just kind of playing in and out with partialing and adding back in until I start to see things like reversal strategies. Um, your technical application might require many tests to confirm the results. It did in terms of testing out, hey, what rules actually are going to work? So the nice thing about the way that I use my Fibonacci fans, there is a limited way that I use them and they are adjusted according to rules. It's really hard to condense them all into just a really short little class like I have here for today. I don't have enough time to expand and teach you know, everything that there is about Fibonacci fans. There are specific times you don't want to use them. Um, there are specific ways that we move them and manipulate them, but they follow rules for those manipulations. So what those they do is that they will then tell us, hey, if something is not going at this level, and it should, for example, you know, coming into a fan support zone where it's not giving a move off of that zone, and it goes past a typical time extension that we're looking at. So let's say this is a two wave correction here. Okay. Just ignore the, the messier part of it. What we would expect is that between the highs, we would want to see about even spacing. So I would want a fan level that is going to be hooking up at the same time that this is going to be having that even spacing coming over here. So if it's not reacting off of that fan and it's kind of just hanging along in here, that this is actually something that happened yesterday that led to um, a continuation on the short side. So if that's not coming off of there, this can actually trigger a short setup, breaking your 76.4% fan, but then the that same fan is going to serve as a resistance level. And in yesterday's session, I had bought um, a position as a hedge because I was short. And so I had bought a position on a hedge at, on something like this. And it broke that channel. I added into my um, long or my short, took off my hedge on the other side. And then it, when after it hit my target zone, I flipped it. But that became the zone that I took off partials and then looked for the measured move on the rest. And over and over again, those measured move levels work really well as long as your momentum is the same. So for example, here we have an initial breakdown 
but then the momentum picks up. So instead of just getting a pure measured move on the continuation on the downside, it's able to go for a little bit more than that measured move. We see the smaller segments of measured movement, but it's able to ultimately push for a bit more because that momentum is faster. For downtrend movement, the Fibonacci fan ought to be used to point some possible endpoint before the trend reverses. Is that correct? Um, if you're using your fans, your fan levels, let's say here we've got um, a downtrend in place. So this might be your correction and your fib fans are going to be based upon your high and your low here. So they're going to, you know, post out these different fan levels you know throughout there and they can be used as support levels but it's not the only thing you want to rely on so you also want to look at other things like the measured moves like previous major zones of congestion um like on this one on the downside move here this is your kneecap zone your hip zone is is here where that's breaking so this is another major level of support where the momentum shifts, the beginning of a momentum shift is a major support level. So you also want to be looking at things like that. It's not just how is it going to get to the fan? It's it's other traits and characteristics. Let me pull up. I've got a folder with some fans. I can show that to you. I've got a few more minutes here before we wrap this up. And it'll be great for you to get a little bit more of a grasp on, on the fans. So I'm just going to open one of my folders. And for those of you that are a Ninja Trader, I have a plugin available so that you can add your fans to Ninja Trader too. Because that platform doesn't come with them. Give me just a second. I've got a lot of stuff open here, but pull this. And I'll just kind of run through some of these really fast. Assuming it opens for me. <laughs> I have so many things open right here, right here on this browser. We'll let that think about it while I pull up. Our chart here on our larger time frame. So one of the things that I was looking for when we were reversing in the overall market, you guys, is that I did use a Fib fan adding it here. And so what we needed to see in order to get something like a, you know, a larger inverse head and shoulders or something that would go into um, a pattern that would head higher. The fact of how it pulled back impacted our movement here. So you can see very quickly that this pulled back more than 50% and it did it in a shorter period of time than it took for the upside to happen. So what I did with my Fib fan on this was, again, I moved it down so that that low hooked up with the 61.8 and that gave me another support level. But at this point, we were back into all of this congestion over here. So the fan to me was not important at this time, even though you can see it held, you know, as, as the next support and it's holding over here as resistance, it's not as important because it's still just too strong of a move on the downside. Now you can see just going from the low to the high, it's still serving as support, 
but it's not enough support to get it to turn and flip around. So let me see if I can get one of these charts open to actually show you. Here is a better example. So if we look at the upside there and the one that I just pulled up and we look at the pullback that is happening here. If you go from that high and low here and then we look at our correction, you can see that it's taking at least that one to one ratio. So in this case, with the going from the high to the low, I'm noticing, oh, we're getting some stalling here at 38.2. We're stalling at 50 percent. It's less than 50 percent of the pullback. So that's great. That means that I'm going to leave my fib fan where it is and I'm going to look for that 76.4 percent to be the support zone. Now, because this still ended up pulling back more than 50 percent, though, it means that I'm still going to struggle to get like a full continuation on the trend as easily. There's an increased risk that it could go into a second correction, in which case that fib fan zone would serve as my support and I would double out. So that would be still a possibility on something like that. Here is another one where I made a manipulation because it started out really fast. So going to that high, it, it didn't have levels that were hooking up. Here's the, the main pullback. It pulls back more than 50%. So I have that 61.8% is hooking up with the um, fan there. And in this case, it works by doing it at the second high. So I don't really need to make any pure manipulations. And then that's giving me my 76.4%. So the only manipulation is just having it at that second high zone. And in here, what I'm looking at is that we are seeing the moves that are pulling back further. Hold on, sorry guys. Where this initially right here, I, let's see if I can make that zoom for you guys. The This initial pullback is about 50% and it does it in that shorter period of time. So then I want my 50% fan to hook up and then that gives me my 76.4. So my manipulation has to do with how long it's, how much that pullback is compared to the upside move, how long it takes in terms of time, and then how far it pulls back. And this took years to, you know, create this, these rules for how I manipulate the FIB fans. And you won't find this anywhere else. This is something that I did through my own studies. So here, Originally, you would have had a move here, but with the higher high, I automatically move it over. And since it's pulling back right around 50% and it's right at that 50% zone, I just left it. And that gives me that 76.4 to look for. So that's what I'm doing. I have um, a lot of classes where I go into these in more detail. Um, I actually want to share with you guys let me grab my PowerPoint here again. I know we are running out of time here, but my core patterns, you have the opportunity here to participate in uh, an eight hour uh, boot camp where I go through all of the core strategies and I use those Fibonacci levels for a lot of the trades for determining target levels. So this class goes into more detail on how to use them, but it goes through every single one of the core strategies that I trade, like that momentum reversal. You're just going to get templates uh, as opposed to just me showing you, hey, this is the one that I traded yesterday. You're going to get templates for them that show you the, the pros and the cons to look for, the things that are going to make it higher probability versus the things that are going to have um, greater risk. And 
how we place our stops and adjust our stops so that you're not just leaving your stop hanging under a previous lower above previous high, how we make those adjustments, and then how we aim for target levels. And they give you basically do or die parameters where, hey, you need to see this happening or else you've got to get more aggressive and just protecting some of your trade because there's a greater failure rate because it's not doing this that it should be doing. So that also helps protect you from getting stuck in situations where you can get flushed out and in patterns that ultimately fail, you can still make money on them because they might have looked good enough to begin with. They might have had like one or two cons, but you still give it a try. But there's specific things that have to happen. So when you see those things happen, then you can adjust your target levels for wider zones you can build into the positions more but if they're not happening even if something looks like it was a perfect textbook strategy but it's not giving you the follow-through immediately it's going up for example and you bought it but it's not going up with the momentum then i teach you how to pay attention to levels that we need to look at for targets and get into more of the trade management aspects of those strategies. So this is a, a really in-depth class. Um, it is something that I, I recommend that anybody who's interested in my style of market analysis takes a, a closer look at so that you have all of those blueprints and then you can start to learn more of the advanced techniques like, hey, in which situations are we gonna manipulate that fan? Because we're not gonna just do it willy-nilly. <laughs> You got to follow the rules. Do I trade futures or just or stocks or whatever? I trade everything, you guys. I started as a stock trader. I predominantly trade futures and commodities right now just because of where I'm at. So whatever country I'm at, whatever time zone I'm at, whether I've got kids in elementary school or kids in high school, it, it all just depends. And I trade whatever, whenever, basically. So right now I am in Arizona and the markets that are easiest for me to be here to focus on are the futures markets because I can just come in and grab some scalps, sometimes get, get some swing trades as well. Um, but uh, when I lived on the East Coast, I loved trading opening gaps. So everything that I've taught you today, the strategy that I taught you, as well as the Fibonacci tools, those can be used on any single market. This class, you guys, is only 197 and you have lifetime access to it. So you can log in and study it anytime. Is it the same fan as in TradingView? TradingView is just a wee bit different. I think they use like 75 instead of 76.4, um, but it's essentially the same. There's not that much difference. And keep in mind when we're, we're taking a trade, the fan is not the, and the, the like magic bullet. It is a huge pro that is going to help you with your market timing. But it, it's not something where you're going to take a trade just because it has the fan support. So these um, techniques and strategies that I'm gonna teach you in that eight hour class, they will show you all of the other building blocks that you want lined up too. So the fan is one of them, but you basically get a checklist. So you can know right away, hey, this is a pro, this is a con. And I take many trades where I have a couple of cons, but the nice thing is, is that it, if it doesn't work out, I can be more aggressive in my management of it. So meaning I'm usually not ending up with a full stop unless it's something that goes against me immediately very quickly. Um, but also, I know going into it that my risk on the trade was higher. So the stop doesn't come as like a shock. You know, it was up to me to take that, um, knowing that. And that knowledge is really important, you know, in building your confidence level. If you don't know why something is stopping out, it makes it harder to take the trade the next time. Well, David, thank you for inviting me back here today. <laughs>